Hello and welcome back. In this series on the early Christian Ecclesia, so far I've talked about the Apostle Paul, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In today's video, I will be talking briefly about the other apostles that Christ also called to follow him to preach the good news of the kingdom to the world. To start out, I would like to mention one of the half-brothers of Jesus who was called James, son of Alphaeus. James was one of the twelve main disciples of Jesus Christ. The New Testament only mentions him in four lists of the disciples. James, son of Alphaeus, is traditionally identified as James the Less and James the half-brother of Jesus. That would make James the author of the book of James and one of the three men Paul called pillars of the early Christian ecclesia. James, son of Alphaeus, is not the same person as James, the son of Zebedee, one of Jesus' closest disciples, who was one of the first apostles to be martyred, as mentioned in Acts chapter 12, verse 2. Some of the disciples' callings receive special attention in the Gospels. Jesus calls Andrew, Peter, and then James, and John, who were brothers, and sons of a man called Zebedee, while they were attending to their fishing business. And he calls Matthew, the tax collector, from his tax booth. James, the son of Alphaeus, doesn't get this kind of attention in the Bible, but he is still one of the twelve apostles. The New Testament lists all twelve apostles four times in Matthew chapter 10, Mark chapter 3, Luke 6, and Acts chapter 1. While there are some variations in the order the apostles appear and even the names they went by, James, son of Alphaeus, is listed in all of them. He's never mentioned in the Gospel of John, but John never explicitly lists all the apostles. James grew up with Jesus as a child. The Bible mentions that Jesus had four brothers in Matthew, the 13th chapter, verse 55 where it says, Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary? And aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Jude? Jesus' brothers didn't put faith in him until after Jesus' resurrection. Apparently, the resurrection changed James' mind. He was there with his mother Mary and the other disciples in the upper room to witness the resurrected Christ. Even though the book of Acts and the epistles never describe James, son of Alphaeus' ministry, he would have been one of the most important leaders of the early Christian congregation. James the Less, also referred to as the Lesser, the Younger, the Little, and the Minor, is mentioned four times in the Gospels, always in relation to his mother Mary, whom John refers to as Mary of Clopas in John chapter 19, verse 25. Technically, the moniker, the Less, is only used once in Mark 15, verse 40. But early Christians used it widely to distinguish which James they were referring to. The moniker is ambiguous, but it's clearly intended to distinguish this James from the James, son of Zebedee, who was one of the most prominent disciples. It could mean he was younger, shorter, or less significant also. Some scholars believe the fact that the gospel writers used the term the lesser here implies that there were only two Jameses that needed to be distinguished between. There is a strong link between James the Less and James the half-brother of Jesus. Jesus had brothers named James and Joseph, as I mentioned a moment ago, and James the Less has a brother named Joseph. You can find that in Mark chapter 15, verse 40. James, the half-brother of Jesus, also known as James the Just, was the leader of the Ecclesia in Jerusalem and is the traditional author of the book of James, as I mentioned. Paul mentions him in Galatians 1 verse 19 while describing a visit to Jerusalem where he says, I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. And Paul continued in Galatians 2 9 recounting a second visit to Jerusalem where the council of Jerusalem took place to discuss whether Gentile believers would have to follow the law of Moses or not. In Acts, James presided over this council. Here Paul describes him as a pillar of the Christian ecclesia along with Peter and John. The early Christian congregations unanimously connected James, the half-brother of Jesus, to James, the leader of the early ecclesia. As one of the twelve apostles, James, the son of Alphaeus, certainly held an important role in the early Christian ecclesia, and he likely played a key part in spreading the gospel of the coming kingdom of God. Moving on to the Apostle Andrew now. Andrew, whose Greek name means manly, was one of Jesus' twelve apostles. 
the brother of Simon Peter and son of Jonah or John, Andrew's name appears on all the lists of the apostles, and his being called by Jesus appears in all three synoptic gospels as well as Acts. Andrew's name comes up multiple times in the gospels. The synoptics show him at the Mount of Olives, and John describes him as a one-time disciple of John the Baptist. The Bible gives us no information on how old Andrew was when he became one of Jesus' disciples. Andrew, like his brother Peter, is depicted as having been called by Jesus to be one of his disciples while fishing in the Sea of Galilee. According to the Gospel of John, he and Peter were natives of Capernaum. Both Andrew and Peter left everything behind to follow Jesus to become fishers of men. This is astounding if you think about it, because they left their lifelong job security the only thing they had ever known, everything that was familiar to them, and obviously they had to leave their family behind too, all walking away at Jesus' invitation. The words, immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him, revealed to us their true spiritual nature. They forsook both their living and their father and family. There isn't much information in the Bible what Andrew is supposed to have done. According to the Synoptic Gospels, he was one of the four disciples, along with Peter, James, and John, who took Jesus aside at the Mount of Olives to ask when the destruction of the temple would occur. John's Gospel tells us more, claiming that Andrew was originally a disciple of John the Baptist, who started following Jesus first. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon Peter and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. In Mark chapter 13, Jesus leaves the temple and tells his disciples that one day it will be destroyed. Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. In Mark 13 verse 2. Later on the Mount of Olives, Peter, James, John, and Andrew privately ask Jesus to tell them when this will happen, and he launches into a lengthy teaching about the end times. This passage is one of the main arguments that Andrew was one of the more prominent apostles because Peter, James, and John saw more of Jesus' ministry than anyone else. And here Andrew is privileged to be a part of this group of men who were taught privately by Jesus. Andrew is probably best known as the brother of Simon Peter, and nearly 2,000 years after his death, it's still the most widely known detail about him. But while Andrew wasn't nearly as prominent in the New Testament as Peter, he still very clearly had an important role in the development of the early Christian congregations. Now we'll move along to the Apostle Bartholomew. The Apostle Bartholomew was one of the twelve disciples and later became an Apostle of Christ. We know precious little of this Apostle because he was so infrequently mentioned in the Bible. Even so, since he was one of the apostles, he must have had significant importance in the early Christian congregation, or Jesus would never have called him in the first place. He was sometimes called Nathaniel, which is a Hebrew name meaning God has given. And since we know that frequently in the Bible God names people for certain attributes, this name is no accident. Philip was the one who introduced Nathaniel to Jesus in John chapter 1, verse 43. Philip, like Andrew, seemed to have a propensity or tendency to bring others to Christ. The name Bartholomew is from the Aramaic bar Tolmei and means son of Tolmei or son of the furrows, which could mean that he was the son of a plowman or a farmer. Bartholomew was born in Cana in Galilee, which, being outside of Jerusalem, may have been a farming community and served as an important region that produced commodities that were essential to the people in Judea. Bartholomew was introduced to Christ by his friend Philip, as I mentioned. His initial reaction to Jesus was skeptical, since he considered anyone from Nazareth as unfit for the work of God, since this was one of those towns that was looked down upon by the Jews, which is why he said, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? In John chapter 1, verse 46. In this text, he is referred to as Nathaniel, but is the same person as Bartholomew. And when Philip found Nathaniel and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Nathaniel asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Bartholomew responded negatively about where Jesus came from, Jesus said, here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. 
To which Nathanael said, How do you know me? Jesus replied, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael seemed to quickly change his mind about Jesus, saying, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. Jesus then replied, You believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than that. He then added, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. John 1, 50-51 This prophecy by Jesus would come true, but not until after Jesus' death and resurrection, and perhaps could be seen to have occurred when Jesus ascended up into heaven, as mentioned in Acts chapter 1. Bartholomew would also later see Jesus after he was resurrected. Other than these accounts of Bartholomew or Nathaniel, we have precious little mention of him in the Gospels, and the only accounts of him are mentioned in the Gospel of John. Bartholomew, as one of the twelve apostles, went out into the world to preach the gospel of God's kingdom. Bartholomew lived out his life as an apostle, which means one sent out specifically by God. He took seriously the great commission that God had given him. The next apostle we'll discuss is Judas Iscariot. The life of Judas Iscariot is one shrouded in deep mystery. Scripture offers little light to cut through the mist. In fact, in any honest treatment of him, the questions should probably outnumber the answers. Even Judas's surname is unclear. Iscariot could mean Kerioth, making him a Judean, or perhaps Man of Sychar, making him a Samaritan. Or it could be a Jewish term for the Latin Sicarius, which means Dagger Man or Assassin. If so, it may identify him with the Zealots who believe that Israel should gain back her freedom through violent means by overthrowing the Roman government. Some may picture Judas as a dark, slinking rascal from the beginning. But this does not appear to be true according to scriptures. After all, Jesus selected him as one of the twelve disciples of the inner circle. Judas sat willingly and listened to Christ's teachings day after day, and the fact that he was the treasurer for the group implies some level of prominence. When the twelve were sent out to heal and preach in the townships, he apparently did his part along with the rest. The only word of recorded dissent we hear was his objection that the expensive perfume poured on Jesus' feet should have been sold for the benefit of the poor. The scripture clarifies that Judas said this because as treasurer, he sometimes pilfered money from the disciples' account. This is our first inkling of Judas' emerging character. The simple truth, however, that Judas was dishonest does not necessarily explain why he betrayed Christ to death. This issue has been debated for centuries, and there are a number of viable possibilities. His first motive could well have been simple greed. As a dishonest treasure, it's obvious Judas was attracted to money and what it could procure. However, the 30 pieces of silver Judas was given for the betrayal would only be worth one or two hundred dollars today. Would this be enough money to significantly interest Judas? Second, Judas may have been a convenient dupe of Satan, and after realizing too late his horrible mistake, he destroyed himself. Or third, especially if he was a dagger man or a zealot, Judas may have been becoming increasingly more disillusioned with a Messiah who gave less and less indication of intending to overthrow the Roman government. As Judas's dream of a lucrative position in a victorious Jewish government began slipping away, he may have become bitter enough to betray Jesus. In the end, we are left to ourselves to decide what dark motives may have prompted this horrific betrayal. Judas's only legacy is his notoriety, preserved even today in idioms that symbolize deception and betrayal. To call someone a Judas is to accuse him or her of insidious backstabbing. And to say someone got sold for 30 pieces of silver means they were fleeced or betrayed by a smooth swindler. It is sadly surprising and painful to us that a man who walked side by side with Jesus for three years could turn traitor like he did. Perhaps the story of Judas leaves us with more questions than answers, yet it also leaves us with a vital question to ask ourselves. Do we betray Christ ourselves when we express staunch loyalty to him and yet live as if we never heard of him? we must make sure that our foundation is strong and not built on sand, so we can stand firm in the worst of storms. Also, Judas was a nationalist at heart. 
Judas wasn't looking to God's kingdom to solve all mankind's problems. I see many Christians today who are looking to human governments like the United States or other countries to save them. Don't be overzealous for human governments like Judas was, but keep looking to the coming kingdom of God, which will eventually remove all man-made governments and replace them with the everlasting kingdom of God. And we'll move on now to the Apostle Jude. Jude the Apostle, also referred to as Jude of James, Judas of James, Thaddeus, Judas Thaddeus, and Labaius, was one of the twelve main disciples of Jesus. Some scholars believe he is the same person as Jude, the half-brother of Jesus, who is traditionally regarded as the author of the book of Jude. Jude the Apostle is only mentioned a handful of times in the New Testament. Jude was one of the twelve apostles. While there are four lists of the twelve apostles in the Bible, only two of them include Jude or Judas, depending on the translation. He was mentioned as Judas, son of James, in Luke chapter 6, and in Acts 1, he was called Judas, son of James. Interestingly, both of these lists were written by Luke. The other two lists, Matthew chapter 10 and Mark 3, appear to replace Jude with his other name, Thaddeus. Even though the book of Acts and the epistles never describe Jude's ministry, as one of the twelve, he would have been one of the most important leaders of the early Christian congregation. Depending on the translation you use, you may see Jude listed as Jude or Judas. A man named Judas, presumably Jude, the apostle, appears in John chapter 14, verse 22. And John makes a point of telling us this is not Judas Iscariot. Some suggest aversion to the name Judas is the same reason why Matthew and Mark replace Jude with Thaddeus in their lists of disciples. Some manuscripts say Labaius, who was surnamed Thaddeus. Since his place on these lists is so close to Jude's placement in Luke and Acts, and it was common for people to be known by two names in the first century, tradition has always assumed that these were the two names for the same person. This is why Jude is sometimes referred to as Jude Thaddeus or Judas Thaddeus. Thaddeus even appears to have been used as a nickname, which means courageous heart. Since the name Judas was so infamous within the Christian congregation, it wouldn't be surprising if Matthew and Mark decided to use a different name for Jude. In any case, early Christians generally accepted that Thaddeus and Jude were one and the same. The author of the book of Jude, which is a very short letter comprising only 25 verses, claims to be written by someone named Jude. In uh, Jude 1, it starts out, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to the called ones, loved by God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. Since the author doesn't make any effort to describe which James he's referring to here, and James was such a common name, most scholars assume this is referring to James the Just, one of the main leaders of the early Ecclesia, believed to be the half-brother of Jesus. If he were referring to another James, the author would have likely made a distinction, since James the Just was so well known to the early Christians. If we accept that Jude the Apostle is the same person as Jude, the author of Jude, and we accept that the James referred to in Jude 1 is James the Just, then Jude the Apostle is also the half-brother of Jesus. Keep in mind, the Bible says Jesus had a brother named Jude. Matthew and Mark both record that when Jesus preached in his hometown, People doubted him because they knew his family, which included his brother Jude. As I mentioned before, Jesus' brothers at first did not believe in him, as mentioned in John chapter 7. Starting in verse 3, it says, Jesus' brothers said to him, Leave Galilee and go to Judea, so that your disciples there may see the works you do. No one who wants to be a public figure acts in secret. Since you are doing these things, show yourself to the world. For even his own brothers did not believe in him. The Bible doesn't mention too much about Jude other than he was the half-brother to Jesus and apostle of Christ. Jude would have been sent somewhere to spread the gospel just as the other apostles were. What we do know is that Jesus called him, he followed, and he played a role in the beginning of a tiny movement which has overtaken the entire world. The next apostle we'll discuss is Simon. He was known as Simon the Zealot. He was one of Jesus' disciples. Generally speaking, a zealot is anyone who fervently supports a particular cause. 
In the context of the New Testament, the zealots were a party zealous for Jewish independence and throwing off Roman rule. They hoped to accomplish this by inciting the people to rebellion, driving the Romans from Israel, and establishing a mosaic theocracy. They were also known to target Jews who were sympathetic to Rome. The New Testament lists all twelve apostles four times, as I've mentioned, and while there are some variations in the order the apostles appear, and even the names they went by, Simon is listed in all of them. This means Simon was one of the people who was closest to Jesus, and that he spent about three years living with him, as most of all the other apostles did. It's usually assumed that he is called Simon the Zealot, because when Jesus called him, he was a member of the Zealot's political movement. In any case, we can assume that his priorities changed as he submitted to Jesus' teaching, which included giving to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and an emphasis on the kingdom of God, which was not of this world and was not established by use of violence and force of arms. Simon would also have been informed by Jesus, revealing that the temple would be destroyed and Jerusalem would be completely overrun by the Gentiles. Keeping the nickname of Zealot may simply have been a way of to distinguish him from the other Simon, who later came to be known as Peter. Perhaps in later years, he was known to be zealous for the gospel. It's interesting to note that Jesus called another disciple, Matthew, who was a tax collector, and who would have been in the employ of Rome directly, or of the Jewish officials who ruled with Rome's blessing. Matthew the publican and Simon the zealot were from opposite ends of the political spectrum. Because of their greater allegiance to Jesus, They were brothers and co-workers for the gospel of the kingdom. Simon left everything in his previous life to follow Jesus. He lived true to the Great Commission after Jesus' ascension. But like most of the other apostles, Simon the Zealot deserted Jesus during his trial and crucifixion. Jesus taught that the kingdom of God would transcend all political causes, governments, and all earthly turmoil His kingdom will destroy all governments opposed to his kingdom rule. It's unfortunate that today many believers seem to be more committed to a political party or a political point of view than to the kingdom that Christ so often taught in his earthly ministry. God is not supporting any man-made government today, even though many nationalists like to think that he does. The book of Daniel and all Revelation clearly show that all nations will be destroyed and replaced by God's eternal kingdom. Okay, next we'll move along to Philip. Philip is listed as one of Jesus' apostles in the four apostolic lists in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Acts. He plays the largest role in John and appears little in the other Gospels. The name Philip means lover of horses. No information is given in the New Testament about when Philip was born or died. The Gospel, according to John, describes Philip as a fisherman from Bethsaida in Galilee, the same town as Andrew and Peter. All of the apostles are thought to have come from Galilee, except perhaps for Judas. Philip is depicted as pragmatic, and he is the one approached by Greeks seeking to speak with Jesus. It's possible that Philip was originally a follower or disciple of John the Baptist because John depicts Jesus calling Philip out of a crowd attending John's baptisms. Philip the Apostle was one of the twelve main disciples of Jesus. This means Philip was one of the people who was closest to Jesus. He spent three years living with him and witnessing his miracles directly and listening to his sermons. We first see Philip in the Bible mentioned in John chapter 1 verse 43 the day after Andrew and his brother Peter first started following Jesus. Jesus was in Galilee when he found Philip and said unto him, Follow me. Philip was from Bethsaida, the same hometown as Andrew and Peter. It's interesting to note that the very next thing we learn about Philip is that as soon as Jesus called him to follow him, he found a man by the name of Nathanael and told him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth the son of Joseph. This demonstrates to us two things. First, that Peter was a man that was searching for the Messiah that was foretold by Moses and the prophets and was willing to immediately follow him when called. Second, that when Philip found Jesus, he immediately went and told Bartholomew or Nathaniel so that he too would follow him. This demonstrates Philip's willingness to communicate the good news of Jesus' coming kingdom to others. Philip's willingness to be ready to serve Jesus was later demonstrated in John chapter 6 
When Jesus found himself being followed by about 5,000 people, Jesus asked Philip where they could buy bread to feed all the people. Philip quickly answered and said that 200 penny worth of bread would not buy enough for everyone to eat, referring to the fact that there was not enough bread for everyone available. Jesus responded by telling the disciples to have the people sit down while he took five loaves of bread and two fish and blessed the food, which miraculously multiplied into so much food that it took 12 baskets just to gather up the leftovers of the bread. Philip's willingness to be part of the ministry of Jesus would play itself out many times afterwards in the years to follow while Jesus was on earth and after his ascension. The Bible mentions Philip in Cana along with the other disciples with Jesus at the wedding where Jesus turned the water into wine. Also the day of Pentecost after the death of Jesus, Philip was assembled along with the other disciples when Jesus appeared to them. Jesus spoke to them and instructed them to wait for the promise of the Father. After this, Philip watched as Jesus ascended into heaven and heard the angels foretell of his return. This event marked the beginning of what would be Philip's participation in the Lord's work as an evangelist after his ascension to heaven. Undoubtedly, the most notable mention of Philip is when the angel of the Lord sent him from the work he was doing with the disciples in Samaria to the desert of Gaza. Philip arose and went as directed. There he found an Ethiopian eunuch that served in the court of Queen Candace of the Ethiopians. The eunuch was reading from the book of Isaiah about the Messiah that would be slaughtered like a lamb in Isaiah chapter 53. Philip asked the eunuch if he understood what he was reading, to which the eunuch replied he did not know what he was referring to. Philip then explained the scriptures to the eunuch, and the eunuch trusted Christ as his Savior and was baptized by Philip. Not much else is known about Philip, but he was a strong preacher of the kingdom and a follower of Christ to the end of his days. Next we'll talk about the Apostle Thomas. Thomas, whose full name was Didymus Judas Thomas. Thomas Didymus means the twin, lived in Galilee, and became one of Jesus' disciples when Jesus called him to join his ministry. Thomas is known as Doubting Thomas because of the famous Bible story in which he demands to see proof of Jesus' resurrection before believing it. And Jesus appears, inviting Thomas to touch the scars of his wounds from the crucifixion. Thomas later asked Jesus a famous question when the disciples were eating the Last Supper with him. John chapter 14, 1 through 4 of the Bible records Jesus telling his disciples, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas's question comes next, revealing that he's thinking of physical directions rather than spiritual guidance. Thomas said to Jesus, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Thanks to Thomas's question, Jesus clarified his point, uttering these famous words in John 14, 6 and 7. Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. They hadn't literally seen God, but the qualities in Jesus that God possesses. Jesus also said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father, because Jesus and Yahweh are so much alike in spiritual qualities. Thomas was a brave man. As Thomas was ready to go to Jerusalem and die with Christ, as mentioned in John chapter 11, while the others tried to talk Jesus out of going back to Judea, Thomas seemed the bravest of them all by saying, let us also go that we may die with him. So we should give Thomas some credit as he was apparently ready to die serving Christ, unlike the other disciples at that time. Thomas has been labeled Doubting Thomas by men because he was never called that in the Bible. That is a label that men have put on him. We should realize that the disciples were not any less doubting than Thomas was because after Jesus' death, they were in hiding and had the doors locked for fear of the Jews, perhaps thinking that they would be next to be killed. It was only after Jesus appeared to them that they finally believed. That's when they tried to tell Thomas, which is recorded in John chapter 20, where it says, starting in verse 24, But Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. 
Therefore the other disciples said to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and put my hands into his side, I will not ever believe. In verse 26 it goes on, And eight days later his disciples were again within, and Thomas with them. Jesus comes, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst of them. Peace be to you. Then he says to Thomas, Reach your finger here and see my hands, and reach your hand here and put it in my side, and do not be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus says to him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples that are not written in this book, but these are written so that you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and so that by believing you will have life in his name. Trinitarians like this verse to try to prove that Jesus is somehow God, but Thomas certainly did not think that Jesus was Almighty God, Yahweh. Just a few verses down in verse 31, Jesus is clearly identified as the Son of God, not God the Son, as Trinitarians like to think. Earlier in John chapter 14, Jesus was explaining to his disciples that he was so much like Yahweh because he was so perfectly reflecting Yahweh's personality that Jesus could say that if you have seen me, you have seen the Father also. Let's read that account, John 14:7. Jesus said, If you had known me, you would have known my father also. From now on you know him and have seen him. Philip says to him, Lord, show us the father, and it it is enough for us. Jesus says to him, Have I been such a long time with you, and do you not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the father. How can you say, Show us the father? Do you not believe that I am in union with the father, and the father is in union with me? The words that I am saying to you, I am not speaking for myself, but the Father living in union with me does his works. So Jesus doesn't say that he is God, the Almighty, but that he is in union with God. And Jesus gave credit to God for all his works that he performed. Jesus never claimed equality with God in the Bible. The problem with some verses is translating Greek into English and translators' biases who want to try to insert their Trinitarian ideas into certain Bible versions and texts. Just before Jesus showed himself to Thomas, Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene. Here's the account starting in verse 10. So the disciples went away again to their home, but Mary was standing outside the tomb crying. Then as she was crying, she stooped down and looked into the tomb, and she sees two angels in white sitting one at the head and one at the feet, where the body of Jesus had been lying. And they say to her, Woman, why are you crying? She says to them, Because they have taken away my Lord. Do not know where they have put him. When she had said this, she turned around and sees Jesus standing, and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus says to her, Woman, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? She, supposing him to be the gardener, says to him, Lord, if you have carried him from here, Tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus says to her, Mary. She turns herself and says to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus says to her, Do not touch me, for I have not yet gone up to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am going up to my Father and your Father and my God and your God. You see here in verse 17, Jesus said that Yahweh was his God and Father. Jesus never claimed to be God. The problem with John chapter 20, verse 28, in most translations, is the translating of the Greek into English. That's where, that's where we run into problems with people misunderstanding this verse. If you look at any Greek interlinear, here's what Thomas Ashley says. He says, the Lord of me and the God of me. See, Thomas was here referring to Jesus as Lord and Yahweh as God. He was not calling Jesus God. Thomas was addressing two different beings, his Lord Jesus and his God Yahweh. The translating of this Greek passage into English is the problem in most translations. And if you take a look here, you can see in the um, Greek interlinear of John 20, verse 28, that the third column from the left It says, Thomas, and said to him, The Lord of me and the God of me. 
The Lord of me and the God of me sounds strange to us in the English language, so the translating of this Greek sentence into English, my Lord and my God, makes this verse easily misunderstood, and people think Thomas was referring to Jesus as God when he was not. The Bible doesn't contradict itself, but it is usually a problem with translating from one language to another. And also, of course, people wanting to insert their doctrinal biases into Scripture. For a more in-depth study of John 20, verse 28, check out the Trinity Delusion channel on YouTube. The Canadian brother who owns this channel focuses on many Scriptures that Trinitarians try to use to support their flawed ideas that God is three persons in one. This brother's name is Kel, spelled K-E-L. He does a great job explaining Trinitarian verses in the Bible. He used to be a Trinitarian himself, so he knows all their false ideas. So just go to his site, The Trinity Delusion. Here's what his channel looks like here, a little picture of that, so you'll know you've got the right channel. So go to his website and type in John 20, verse 28, in the search bar or you can go to Google and just type in the Trinity delusion and then type in John 2028 20, either way you'll find several videos of his on this statement where Thomas says in Greek the Lord of me and the God of me he explains in more detail the Greek structure of that sentence and how it applies to two persons Jesus as his Lord and Yahweh as his God the definite article word the shows John is referring to two separate persons when he says, the Lord of me and the God of me. So he goes into great detail on that. I think one of his videos is around 40 minutes long. It's very, very good. So go check out his channel, subscribe to him, and check out his many great videos that he has made to defend against the false trinity doctrine. I didn't have much time in this video to spend on that subject, so I, I wanted to uh, tell you about his channel. And not only for this verse, for many, many verses like, like John 1.1 1, 1, that Trinitarian Jews. So check him out, subscribe to him, and uh, you'll really enjoy his channel. But in 1 John 4.12 it says, No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. Again in John 1.18, No one has ever seen God, the only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father. He has fully explained him. If Jesus were God, then many thousands of people would have seen him. The Bible does not lie. So Jesus was clearly the Son of God. Never did Jesus try to say that he was Yahweh, the one and only God. There are many verses in the Bible that Trinitarians try to prove that Jesus is God, and I will be addressing those verses at some future time. For now, we'll get back to the Apostle Thomas. Not much is said in the Bible about Thomas after Jesus appeared to him and the other disciples. But Thomas was no more doubting than the rest of the disciples, and the only reason he doubted and the others didn't was because they had seen the resurrected Christ, and he had not yet seen him at that time. When the women came back from the empty tomb and after seeing Jesus raised from the dead, the other disciples also doubted. Thomas was a strong believer, a man of good courage, and a powerful preacher of the true gospel of the coming kingdom of God. Okay, I'm going to end this video here now that I have covered all of the 12 apostles of Jesus. And in my next video, I will sum up the main message that Christ taught his apostles to preach to the world. And we will take a good look at how most modern religions today are falling far short of what Jesus taught. So stay tuned for that, and thanks very much for watching.